Months later, in the Presnia district of central Moscow, a new spy versus spy drama unfolds. In a Moscow marketplace, a mysterious Soviet volunteer approaches the U.S. Embassy officer. He passes him highly classified information about Soviet military aircraft and their capabilities. The stranger could be a KGB trap. In the spy trade, it's called a dangle. We were convinced that this was someone that they were putting in front of us to try to make a double agent. Still reeling from the death of their star asset, in addition to crucial intelligence, the man offers his name, Adolf Tolgachev. It turns out he was a scientist working on some of the most sophisticated and sensitive military aircraft systems in the Soviet Union. He had come to hate the Soviet government. He decided the thing that could hurt the Soviet regime was to provide intelligence to the U.S. government. And Tolkachev holds the key to their secrets. One man could tip the balance of power in the Cold War. CIA came to the conclusion that he was legitimate and that contact should be pursued. Nine months after the shutdown, the CIA's Moscow station is back in the game. Hathaway assigns a case officer to make contact. The CIA chief is betting his career on the Soviet scientist. Tolgachev is betting his life. Moscow, 1978. The CIA and KGB are at war. After a string of deadly losses, the CIA's hopes ride on a single Russian scientist, Adolf Tolgachev. But in Moscow, the typical spy rules don't apply. Moscow was a place where KGB had complete control. They had the resources to put surveillance on American officers 24-7, 365 days a year. Everybody is followed in Moscow. A colleague told me a story about when the family dog that they had adopted there had to be put to sleep. He took the dog to the vet, and as he left, one of his surveillance actually approached him and said, I'm really sorry about your dog. You know, I was with you when you got him. The CIA has to deliver the tools of the spy trade to Tolgachev and avoid the eyes of the KGB. You have to make sure that you don't do anything operationally if you're being followed. The case officer has previously emplaced a dirty construction glove containing film, camera, and instructions. He discreetly lets Tolkachev know how to find it. This is a classic dead drop. The dead drop is the spy game's most reliable exchange. The two parties never meet but vital secrets are delivered. Tolkachev provides technical data on the MiG-23 fighter aircraft just a few months after its first flight. The Americans learn that it's far more advanced than had been previously anticipated. There's an even newer fighter, the Su-27, that the Americans didn't even know existed. This is priceless information for the Pentagon. Tolkachev seems to be the answers to the CIA's prayers but he doesn't want to exchange information using dead drops. He can't stand the idea of leaving documents that could be traced to him unattended. He insists on delivering secrets in the most dangerous way possible, face to face. Tolgachev's apartment building is located in central Moscow's Presnia district, literally steps from the US embassy where his CIA handlers work. It's the most watched location in all of Moscow, and KGB tactics are extreme. In some cases, KGB officers covertly apply female dog pheromones to the shoes of their CIA targets, enabling a male dog to track the Americans by scent. The CIA is forced to step up their game. To be certain he loses the KGB on his way to the meeting, the case officer uses a magician's trick. In 1953, renowned magician John Mulholland wrote a manual of misdirection for the CIA. 
with the KGB in pursuit, Moscow Station launches a deception called Jack in the Box. How it works is if you're driving your officer, you'll execute a turn, go around a bend where your surveillance cannot see you. And while you're out of sight, while you're in the black, the officer actually jumps out of the car. Then the driver would pop up a marionette. As far as this KGB surveillance and cars trailing behind the officer's car, they would see a head in the passenger seat and think that the officer was still in the car. The jack-in-the-box works like magic. But with hundreds of KGB agents in Moscow, the case officer is still in danger of being spotted. His next trick is a vanishing act. When they slipped out, they would dress down to try to look like a common Soviet worker or what have you. In one case, he actually splashed some vodka on himself to make him look like he was a drunk coming home from a bender. Anything to try to blend in and look like just another Russian on the streets of Moscow. In this case, it worked perfectly. The case officer was able to break free of surveillance and meet securely with Tokachev and exchange vital information. The meetings are nerve-wracking. But Tolgachev's determination to undermine the corrupt Soviet system spurs him on. He never spoke of his death, but he knew full well that he was putting his life in jeopardy. He also insists on keeping his family completely in the dark. Tolgachev made it very clear that his family would not know and could not know what he was doing. And that was important because he would put them at risk if they knew. He loved his wife and he loved his son. They had one child, uh, Oleg, wanted to be an architect. Tolkachev very much wanted to help his son be successful. In addition to money, Tolgachev asks for favors for his son architectural books and supplies, Western rock and roll, all provided by the CIA and made to look like black market purchases. For two years, Tolgachev smuggles top secret documents out of his office. By 1981, the Americans are quickly developing countermeasures to new Soviet aircraft. The KGB knows something is wrong. The Soviets are convinced there must be a traitor, a spy in the system. Workers are now searched before leaving Tolgachev's office. He won't be able to take documents home. He's willing to take pictures at work, but he wants an insurance policy, the worst kind. That insurance policy was a suicide bill. He did not want to fall into the hands of the KGB. He felt that if it came to that, he would rather take his own life. The CIA offers him an alternative, a plan to smuggle him and his family out of the country. Tolgachev picks his poison. He rejected any CIA offers of an exfiltration plan because he knew that his family would never want to leave the Soviet Union. So he was almost resigned to his fate. April 1983. After six years of spying, the walls begin to close in on Tolgachev. The KGB launches an investigation at his office. They believed that there had been a leak from the Institute and there was going to be a crackdown and then everybody was going to be investigated. The Soviet Union was a place where people turned each other in all the time. In the midst of this, Tolkachev's boss appears and summons him to his office. He slips the suicide pill under his tongue, ready to bite down at any moment. There are two guards just outside the office. He's expecting the KGB to burst in any moment. Put him in cuffs. If this happens, he'll bite down on the suicide pill and die. Just... 
As the conversation goes on, it becomes apparent that his boss is asking routine questions. He does not suspect Tolkachev. Tolkachev survives another day. He returns to his desk and he immediately resumes taking photographs. He was seconds away from ending his own life, and five minutes later, he's back to spying. He pushed the envelope. He was what I like to call a driven spy. Due to the KGB's heightened surveillance, the CIA cuts the number of meetings to just two a year. Togachev was not so lucky. They announced that Togachev was executed uh, a year later for espionage. Pentagon officials said Tolgachev's information saved the U.S. billions of dollars and over five years of research and development time. Ultimately, this one man helped bring about the end of the Cold War. Because Tolgachev made sure his family knew nothing about his spying, he saved them from KGB retribution. Years later, when the days of Soviet domination were a fading memory, his son, Oleg, became a successful architect in Moscow, fulfilling his father's dream.